Hey everyone, I'm Michael Unger, the program coordinator here at the H.R. McMillan Space Center. If you've ever come into the building before, you may have noticed the shape of the building. Some people think it looks like a UFO, others a hide a hat. And that's a good reminder because this building, built in 1968, was built on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh Nations. In front of the building, you'll notice that there's a large crab sculpture that was placed here in 1968 by George Norris. And the crab has two meanings. One, the crab is a symbol of the zodiac, Cancer. But also, the First Nations people believed that the crab was a protector of the inlet. Looks pretty cool, doesn't it? All right, and here I am, Michael, live from my kitchen. Uh, welcome to Cosmic Nights, everyone. Uh, if you have been to a Cosmic Night before, uh, you can tell us in the chat in YouTube, uh, maybe even tell us which Cosmic Night you've been to before. Maybe it was the very first Cosmic Night, Pluto Palooza in uh, 2015. Wow, it was a long time ago. Uh, or maybe the last one we did in January, all about space debris. Uh, and since it's Cosmic Nights, uh, we have a chance to socialize. So use the chat feature in YouTube uh, to chat with each other. Uh, maybe tell us uh, what you're drinking. Uh, I have my soda stream here, some of the uh, perks of working at home, but uh, at home, uh, sorry, in my fridge right behind me, I've got a nice cold uh, dark matter from Hoyne. It's good to uh, support local. Uh, so tonight uh, we are celebrating Earth Day, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. April 22nd, 1970 was the very first one. So if we think about what was happening around that time for them to start this day of celebration about our home planet, well, there was a lot of social upheaval, there was war going on. And if you think back one year previous, 1969, we celebrated just last year, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 astronauts walking on the moon. And those astronauts, when they went out into space, they looked back on our, on our home planet and they took pictures, very similar to the one that's behind me right now. And they saw our planet from a completely new perspective. They didn't see borders dividing the countries. They, they could barely even see people. What they saw was the blues, the whites. Our planet was a living, breathing place that has been here living for much longer time than any humans have. And that perspective gave us one that maybe we should take care of our planet. So every April 22nd, we celebrate Earth Day and we're very excited to share this Cosmic Night Earth Day with you. And for the next hour or so, uh, we're going to uh, do some fun stuff. This is a bit of an experiment uh, here in my kitchen. This is sort of like uh, Wayne's World uh, uh, DIY television. Uh, so hopefully uh, all this technology uh, works. Uh, bear with us. Uh, but I, we're going to have some fun, or at least I'm going to have some fun. Uh, and 
it's not just to be me uh, monologuing to you about Earth Day. I have some very special guests uh, with me. So I'm going to bring in uh, my coworker, our uh, resident astronomer at the Space Center, and that would be Rachel Wang. Hey, Rachel, how's it going? Hi, good. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> awesome. How's your, uh, how's working at home uh, working out for you? It's really nice. The commute is really short. It's only about three steps away from my bed, so that's quite nice. <laughs> uh, but I've been trying to get outside and soaking up the natural light from our sun once in a while. <laughs> awesome. So a little bit later on, Rachel, you're going to be giving us a uh, presentation, uh, sort of like a head, sort of like a planetarium. Uh, but a little bit later on, we're going to be joined by our featured speaker who just joined us, and that is uh, Joanna Wagstaff, who was on mat leave, but she's uh, maybe taking a break from that uh, to join us. And thank you so much Rachel I mean so uh, Joanna for uh, for joining us uh, it's a pleasure to be here virtually um, yes my husband is putting the one-year-old down to bed so <laughs> at any minute he may bust through and uh, we'll have a, a YouTube moment I'm sure heads up yeah, just uh, just like that beep just like the BBC we'll go exactly. viral <laughs> it will yeah <laughs> warning <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much, Rachel and Joanna, for joining us. It is Earth Day. Uh, so I'll pose a question to each of you. Um, and perhaps we'll start with you, Jenna, since you're our guest. What does Earth Day mean to you? Well, Michael, I think that we interact with the planet around us in so many different ways every single day. Earth Day is a nice chance to take a pause and really think about what I think is the most important issue of our time. And especially on this day with everything happening, it's, it's a really nice chance to remember how and why we're all physically connected. Nice. How about you, uh, Rachel? Uh, for me, Earth Day is kind of both sentimental and an optimistic event for me. Sentimental because uh, my family grew up celebrating Earth Day, so we would turn off the lights, grab flashlights, and hunker down <laughs> over a Monopoly board and yell at each other in the darkness, and that was always really fun for me. Um, but then it evolved into uh, this idea that, you know, our our Earth can band together as a global community and like images from Earthcast, images like the one behind us um, show that there are no borders from space. And I really like that idea that we can recognize that our Earth is in this dire state and then band together and do something about it. Yeah, so have you uh, played any board games today then? No, I'm trying to keep my yelling to a minimum while I'm at <laughs> home with my roommate. <laughs> Awesome. Well, of course, in the chat, uh, please let us know uh, all of your uh, perspectives as well. Uh, everyone that did join in uh, through Eventbrite, uh, hopefully you got a, a PDF of a little sheet here because at Cosmic Nights, uh, we do have uh, activities. Usually you come into our gallery space, we have some activities. So we have an activity for you. And as you see uh, on the activity sheet, it says, uh, what is your favorite thing on earth? And Rachel and Joanna, uh, did you get each, each of yours uh, as well? Yeah. Awesome. So we maybe we'll take... <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so maybe we'll take a bit of a break. We'll give you uh, viewers at home a little bit of a chance. If you haven't uh, uh, downloaded that to do a little bit of artwork, a little bit of prose, we actually got some submissions in uh, from uh, people ahead of time as well. So we're going to take a little bit of a break and we're going to watch a video uh, from Earthcast. Rachel, you just mentioned them. Earthcast is a local company that it takes beautiful pictures and videos of our planet from space. Uh, they're really cool. So let's watch a little video uh, from Earthcast. We'll take a little bit of break and then we'll come back and, and share our art.
yeah, that was Earthcast. They are a local company here in Vancouver. And if you want to learn more about them, I sat down with Christopher Rappersad, uh, and he's one of the engineers there. And we discussed what Earthcast does. They take these pictures and videos from space, and they do more than just you know um, look at our planet. Uh, they actually study our, uh, the agriculture, and they help farmers uh, with the farmland. And they use this really cool radar technology. So we're going to post that video on our YouTube page, as well as our social media channels. It's less than 10 minutes, uh, but it really gets into some cool stuff. But let's bring Joanna and Rachel back in here to see uh, if they can share some of their uh, artwork with us. Uh, Joanna, um, what's, uh, what, what have you uh, got to share with us? Okay, well, I have a picture of my <laughs> son, Wesley. He is absolutely my favorite thing on earth. And I mean, he just turned a year old. All the cliches are true. I really am seeing the earth and the world through his eyes now. He has recently become obsessed with the ocean and rocks. I mean, is he my kid or what? And it's just a, a reminder that uh, I really do want him to have the same experiences with the earth uh, that, that I had growing up and, and a reminder that it's more important now than ever that we uh, fight climate change and appreciate the earth. Yeah, amazing. You know, I've been watching uh, your amazing uh, Instagram stories that you do with him. <laughs> I particularly like the one where uh, you taught him all about the water cycle <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the tub. Oh, it's. Perfect. I think we have. I think we have a future meteorologist on our hand. I don't want to project or anything, but uh, he shows. He shows promising signs. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. How about you, Rachel? Uh, what uh, What have you got to share with us? Uh, so I cheated a little bit, and I didn't quite pick something that was on earth. I have a um, picture over earth and I have over here a little satellite and it says that that's radar sat over nice, here. Nice. So that's a Canadian space agency earth observing satellite. And I drew little arrows because I like the interconnectivity here on earth. And that's nice. Thing. Awesome. Uh, amazing. And hopefully uh, lots of you at home uh, have uh, some artwork as well. That you might want to share. Of course, you can share that with us on our social media channels uh, at Space Center YVR is our Twitter and our Instagram. But we did have some that were shared with us ahead of time. And I just want to go to a few of them right now. Now, I know that not a lot of people are going on field trips right now. But Cole from Mission BC, uh, he went on a bit of a, a field trip with his family to the wetland sanctuary. And uh, as you can see, when you go on a field trip and you just explore, I think this is a great example of just going someplace and just using all of your senses. And of course, he found this tiny little frog in the, uh, the wetland sanctuary. And he actually even sent us like a full sort of like field trip journal of uh, the things that he found. <laughs> he really did his homework. Uh, so hopefully his teacher is gonna give him, him full marks. Uh, I also wanted to share uh, another one that was sent in to him with us. Of course, uh, these days when we're all at home, um, you know, finding new hobbies, I want to share this one here, which was uh, Debbie from Richmond. And uh, Debbie was showing off uh, some of her fabric art skills. And uh, she says, practicing physical distancing and modeled by Canadian wildlife. Her favorite three uh, wildlife, which is the Kermode bear, the mallard, and the Western Painted Turtle. Uh, I love it. Uh, really cool stuff. And of course, uh, if you have any of that stuff that you'd like to share with us, uh, we'd love to see it. I mean, I'd definitely like to see it. Um, so now let's go and do something a little bit spacey. And let's go uh, to our in-house astronomer, Rachel, uh, who's going to take us out into space and tell us all about Earth's place in the universe. Take it away, Rachel. Sure, I'd love to. Uh, so just while we're waiting for the screen sharing streaming to start, let me tell you a little bit about the visuals you're about to see. So we're going to start off here in our local solar system. And you'll notice that the image that you're seeing is like a circle. And the reason for that and the reason why you're not seeing the regular rectangular image that you're used to is because I'm actually using the same software that we use in the planetarium. So this circle would really map and project onto our dome at the Space Center. But unfortunately, because we can't access the planetarium, um, I can bring to you the exact same visuals that you would see in the planetarium right in the comfort of your own home. So let's talk about Earth's place in the universe. And our place, our understanding of our place in the universe has been shaped by over 400 years of telescopic observations. And it all began with the geocentric model or the Ptolemaic model of the heavens. And that was this idea that Earth is the center of the universe. 
And it wasn't until Nicholas Copernicus, who in 1543 published his model, and the world experienced this growth and understanding that is known today as the Copernican Revolution. And suddenly the earth was no longer this body at the center of the universe, and we started to view our local heavens as sun-centered or heliocentric. And by the end of the 20th century, the overall structure of the visible or what we call observable universe was becoming clear and clear. And our cosmic perspective on Earth's place in this ever expanding space evolved into the one that we have today. Now this current picture can be broken up into nine frames. And I'm gonna start us off here with Earth, natural satellite, the moon. And it took the Apollo astronauts about four days to get to the moon. And that's because it's pretty far away. It lives around 380,000 kilometers away. Now, if we fly out to the solar system, we'll be able to see Earth's location as the third planet from the sun. Now, at this scale, astronomers measure things in terms of, well, how many Earth-Sun distances away does something lie? And we call one Earth-Sun distance one astronomical unit, or one AU. Now, for example, the asteroid belt lives around 3.2 AU away, or 3.2 times the Earth-Sun distance. And the next scale that we're going to look at is the sun's location with respect to the outer solar system. And that means with respect to planets like Jupiter, which live 5.2 AU away, or things like Pluto and the Kuiper Belt, which live around 40 AU away. Now, of course, we can back out even further, and eventually we'll arrive at our beautiful Milky Way galaxy. And at this point, things are too far apart to describe them with astronomical units. So instead, astronomers turn to using the fastest thing in the universe, and that's light, to measure distances. And we call the distance that it takes light to travel in one year, we call that one light year. And one light year is 63,000 AU, or 63,000 times the Earth-Sun distance. And now what's really cool is, if I turn on the constellation lines that we normally see here in our nighttime sky, we'll see that we actually live on the Orion arm of the Milky Way galaxy in a particular location called the Orion Spur. And we really live in kind of the suburbia of the Milky Way galaxy, far away from the downtown hubbub of the local black hole that we have in the middle of our Milky Way galaxy. And zoom back further. Now we're looking at the Milky Way's location in the local group. And the local group is just a collection of nearest major and minor galaxies. And right now we're looking at our sister galaxy, Andromeda, which we're due for a collision with in about 5 billion years. Now the question is, what are we going to name the resulting galaxy? Are we going to call it Andromeda Way? Mildromeda? Who knows? But thankfully, we do have 5 billion more years to think of a better name than the two I just pitched. And let's zoom back out even further. Now we see the local group's location within the Virgo supercluster. And that's part of an even larger Laniakea supercluster. But of course, it doesn't stop there because Virgo and Laniakea are not the only two superclusters out there. So we can actually judge Laniakea's location among the nearest superclusters in the universe, just like we judge the Milky Way's location with respect to galaxies in the local group. Now, if we fly back as far out as we can see, we would hit the edge of the observable universe. And our observable universe is a whopping 93 billion light years across. But with the software right now, I can take us to the edge of the cosmic microwave background or the CMB. And that's essentially just leftover light or radiation from the formation of our universe. So from the big bang. Now I really should say edge in air quotes because the CMB is really all around us. But for us to visualize a CMB, it has to go on a model and that model just happens to be a sphere right here. And now I'd like to take a moment to pose a question. If the universe is so large, almost incomprehensibly so, then why have we found life in only one place, only here on Earth? Now, there are two ways of looking at this puzzle. We can say one, that the origin of life an evolution of complex biological processes on Earth required an extremely unlikely combination of astrophysical and geophysical events and circumstances. And that would mean that we are rare, we are alone, and perhaps we're even one of a kind. 
Now, on the other hand, in the 1970s and 80s, astronomers Carl Sagan and Frank Drake argued that Earth-like planets are typical. And that would mean that our universe is actually teeming with intelligent, complex life that we just haven't found yet. So now the question becomes, how rare is life if life as we know it only exists in one place, and that's here on Earth? Where else would we find it? Do you have a guess or a, or a hypothesis? If you do, I really encourage you to share it below in the comments. And that concludes my talk. So Michael, I'll bring it over back to you. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. So I'm going to unspotlight you, and then we're going to bring back Joanna into the conversation here. And I got to start my video again. There we go. <laughs> awesome. That was very cool. I haven't actually seen that technology. I mean, are you just literally all day playing with it at home now that you can? <laughs> Honestly, yes. There's a lot of cool things you can do. Um, you can turn on the constellation, constellation figures. You can fly around all around the universe. It's very cool to do that from the comfort of your own home. <laughs> I, I don't want. I don't want to take up uh, anyone's <laughs> questions on YouTube, but I. Uh, I just want to ask um, what yeah. you think the the next technology that we're we're waiting for to see in greater detail or farther than before. I mean, I feel like we've got such a great map. <laughs> what What's next? So I like many other people and waiting for the James Webb Space Telescope to finally launch. Um, they do say that it will be launched in March 2021, but I've been hurt before by NASA and with JWST, so I'm still <laughs> holding out for that one. And I feel like that will be um, a major breakthrough in looking for exoplanets or Earth-like planets because, you know, JWST can be, will be able to see further than Hubble will. And not only that, it's looking in the infrared regime of the electromagnetic spectrum, which means that it won't be blocked by all the dust and interstellar stuff that's in between us and planets that are really far away. It'll be able to see right through that. So I'm really excited when JWST gets launched. Hopefully it's 2021, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So we do have uh, some questions coming in from YouTube. And of course, uh, if you have any questions for Rachel, pop them in here. Uh, did get a shout out from uh, some of our staff members, Pablo. Uh, hey to all of our uh, our staff member um, uh, staff members at the Space Center are all uh, at home right now. Uh, Pablo thinks that Mars could be an interesting place to look for life, maybe in some underground lakes. Uh, so that's a good possibility. Someone else thinks maybe there's more life in another galaxy. Um, and someone thinks that maybe we're just alone in the universe, which, you know, that could be a possibility as well. Um, but we do get a question uh, for you, Rachel. Mm -hmm. So if the universe isn't a sphere, what shape is it? <laughs> so this is really, the shape of our universe is really talking about the geometry of our universe. And we seem to think with a lot of um, observations from Planck and uh, WMAP that our universe is this flat uh, shape. And flat is really kind of a two-dimensional analogy for what it really is. What it really is is something called Euclidean, which basically means that parallel lines will never ever cross. And when you sum up all the angles in a triangle, it'll always add to 180 degrees. And we know this to about a margin of error of 0.4%. So I'm gonna say that we're pretty sure that <laughs> the shape of our universe is flat or Euclidean. Cool. Um, another question uh, that come in from an eight-year-old, and maybe this could be a bit of a, a teaser because we are going to be doing a whole bunch of uh, Q and A's uh, on specific topics. In fact, we may even do another Cosmic Night uh, maybe soon on on this topic. But you did mention uh, as you were flying uh, outside of our Milky Way galaxy, you did kind of like throw in there that <laughs> there's a black hole at the center of our galaxy. Maybe uh, give us a little bit of a teaser. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that black hole and then uh, we'll maybe get into more detail in the, uh, the next Q&A. Sure, so the teaser would be that um, our local black hole is called Sagittarius A star. And what's really interesting about it is that actually it was one of the candidates for the first ever black hole picture. Um, but because of where we are in the Milky Way galaxy and the fact that we'd have to look through a lot of high energy stuff, high, a lot of activity that's going on in the center of the black hole, we decided to look at a different black hole instead, and that was M87 star. But I believe the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration is working on getting that photo of Sagittarius A star. So I'm really excited to see that. Um, do you have uh, any idea when that photo may be coming out? Ooh, I think it's on the same timeline <laughs> as JWST. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Another question from Miles. Uh, he's five years old. He wants to know where the aliens are. 
where the aliens uh maybe in area 51 i haven't been there yet so i can't tell you conclusively <laughs> but i do like to believe that we aren't alone in this universe i like to think that well we have 200 to 400 billion stars in the milky way galaxy on average there's around one planet per star so that's 200 to 400 billion planets that we have to look at and see if they're earth-like and see if they have life on there so i think that the universe is so big that from a math standpoint, there probably are aliens out there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. You know what, Miles? Uh, when I first started looking at the stars, my actually introduction was through a movie uh, that we're going to celebrate on May the 4th. It's called Star Wars. So in my head, there are aliens out there and we just need to look harder. Uh, so that's another teaser for our next event, May the 4th, we're gonna be doing all about Star Wars. Uh, and I did uh, just see in, uh, in my chat, uh, something about uh, perhaps my nieces are watching right now uh, from Australia, uh, Luca and Javi. Uh, if you're watching in Australia, hi, I just uh, was able to pull off uh, from my fridge, uh, a picture of uh, Luca that I have uh, on my fridge fridge back here um and of course they're in australia and if you're uh tuning in from somewhere else in the world uh put that in the chat as well we'd be really curious to see how many people around the world uh are are um are hanging out with us okay so we're going to take a quick little break uh before we go to our final presentation of the night and uh the aforementioned canadian space agency we partner with them on a whole bunch of cool stuff they have made a special video for us for us on Earth Day. So let's watch a little video and take a quick little break and we'll come back with our final presentation. While looking at Earth from space, Canadian Space Agency astronaut David Saint-Jacques was amazed by the beauty of our planet. He called Earth humanity's spacecraft. Earth is keeping billions of people alive and billions of animals and billions of plants alive in the deadly vacuum of space. So we are all astronauts and our main spacecraft is, is Mother Earth. We are responsible to keep Earth in good shape. We can find solutions and when we work together, we can accomplish miracles and things that we thought were impossible. That gives me a lot of hope for the future. Earth imagery from space helps us better understand the science of our planet and find solutions to protect our environment. All right, yeah, thank you to the uh, Canadian Space Agency. I'm gonna stop sharing there, bring back my camera. Hey everyone. Uh, and I did actually get a chance to meet David St. Jacques. He's uh, such an amazing individual. Uh, he's back home now. He was up on the space station for a while. And it's really cool. There are NASA astronauts up there. We're gonna post uh, another Earth Day video that NASA put together as well. Um, so much cool stuff that is happening uh, out there. Okay. We've come to it. We've come to our final uh, presentation of the night. Uh, so we're gonna bring in uh, Joanna. And where did uh, Joanna go? Oh, I got to stop my spotlight. And there we are. Let's uh, let's spotlight you, uh, Joanna. And we're going to unmute you as well. Here I am. There you go. Take it away. Thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you, everyone ha who has joined in uh, virtually for this uh, grand experiment. No idea how many of you have drinks in your hands or pants on. <laughs> um, it doesn't even matter. I, uh, I, I'm really, really happy to be here on Earth Day at home. Um, and what a perfect day to talk about um, my two favorite topics, earthquakes and climate change. Very uplifting, I know. But I have sort of made it my, my life's work and my passion really with these two topics is getting people prepared for them. And that's why in this current crisis, the pandemic that we're all facing right now, it's one that at first I, I really felt a bit hopeless to. I've devoured the data, I've analyzed the available modeling, I've tried to brush up on epidemiology, but ultimately I feel powerless uh, when it comes to trying to help us all get through this. And that's why I'm sitting at home with all of you, uh, letting all of the, uh, the real heroes on the, on the front lines do their thing. But as I look forward to what Earth Day means in the future and what kind of Earth we might be living on in terms of what that means for all of us in the future, I can't help but look to the past for signs of hope. And despite the fact that earthquakes and climate change do seem a bit depressing, I, I have found uh, some hope that I want to share with you. Earthquakes and global warming. Um, 
they seem very different in some ways. One is a natural disaster, a process deep within the earth. And let me see if I can uh, figure out how to share my screen. Here comes the moment where you check to see if I have any embarrassing tabs up. Ooh, I prepared for this. Okay, here we go, sharing the screen. Great, and you can still see me. Virtual success. Okay, so let's start with earthquakes. Uh, earthquakes is definitely, earthquakes are definitely a natural disaster. They are a process deep within the earth that begins with the spinning outer core, generating this convective current that moves the plates of ocean and earth crust that sit basically floating on the surface of our planet. And when these plates get stuck together and energy builds up for century, that release happens in the form of an earthquake and it comes with great power. Now, the other natural disaster is not so natural uh, when we talk about global warming. At the very basic level, humans have been pumping CO2 into the atmosphere since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. And as a result, we've physically changed the chemical makeup of our atmosphere, allowing solar radiation to stay locked in at lower levels for longer periods of time, heating up the earth and creating more intense and more extreme weather disasters at a rate and intensity that we've never seen before in history. This one is a slow moving disaster. We know that we're in the midst of a climate change crisis right now. It's happening all around us to all of us, but sometimes these changes creep up so slowly we don't realize they're taking place until all of a sudden we step back and realize we've just gone through back to back record fire years on the West Coast and that's our new normal. Earthquakes on the other hand, it's a disaster that when it happens, it will change our physical landscape forever but we really have no idea exactly when and where the next one will happen. It could be in the next few moments and it could be in the next century. And we know we're waiting for one on here, here on the West Coast. So both of these disasters will play out in very different ways, but preparation and community coming together is the answer to both of them, which is why I think I found such a passion in both of these topics. The other commonality is that we can recover. We have come together through great crises in the past. When trying to think of an analogy for what's taking place to, uh, to us right now, I, I sort of have to combine two events, the Great Depression and the 1918 uh, flu pandemic, the Spanish flu. So perhaps we've never seen anything like we're seeing right now on such a large scale, but there are examples from all over the world of people coming together in unexpected ways following a crisis. And I just wanna show you a few pictures. After every major earthquake, every weather disaster, no matter where in the world it happens, the first images we see are people wanting to gather together. Uh, you're seeing here on the left and the bottom right images um, after the Nepal earthquake in 2017. Uh, and then Christchurch up on the top right, 2010. People want to come together, gathering in fields, uh, sleeping out in the open, borrowing tents. Uh, this is also from Nepal. Uh, sharing food, sharing cell phone services. Uh, this is from Mexico uh, just a couple years ago. Uh, playing games with children. Uh, and it's help coming from the outside too. Volunteers after a crisis are what get communities through. Uh, this is after Superstorm Standy in New York. And of course, these are images from our back-to-back -back fire seasons in BC, 2017, 2018, uh, record fire years for our province. When working on uh, my podcast, I've done a couple of podcasts that look both at what earthquake, what an earthquake, a major one will do for the West Coast of BC and um, what climate change will do to our province as we move forward in time. And experts in both fields said that without a doubt, they know Canadians will come together after an earthquake and after each individual weather event, as we've seen before. Uh, and it's based on what happens around the world. So I took some comfort in knowing that Canadian experts who are working on these problems right now know that Canadians will rise to the occasion. And we have seen that around the world. I want to take you through one particular example, though, that has really struck with me or really stuck with me, and one that in a way has become a test case for all other studies that followed um, in all other natural disasters around the world. I want to take you back to March 27th, 1964, to the Great Alaska Earthquake. This is when 970 kilometers of fault line of rock ruptured at once. It was a mega thrust earthquake. So two plates were moving towards each other. They um, got stuck over 500 years of stress built up and gave way, punching about 18 meters of rock up to the ocean floor. And that resulted in a 9.2 mega thrust earthquake. 
Uh, it's still the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in North America. It's the second most powerful earthquake recorded in world history. Uh, tsunamis from this earthquake caused damage as far away as California and Japan. And it took the city of Anchorage, uh, it shook the city of Anchorage for about four and a half minutes, shaking that was so strong, uh, people couldn't even stay standing. A giant chasm opened up in the middle of the city uh, and it ran for two blocks. On one side, every storefront just plummeted into the crack. Uh, one witness said it looked like the devil ground his heel into it. Now, at the time, Alaska was only five years and hadn't really found its identity in America yet. Uh, Anchorage is the biggest city. It, it was the biggest city at the time uh, and still is. 100,000 people back in 1964. But most weren't really sure if this was their home. It, it didn't feel permanent. It felt more, more transient at that time. Uh, the city had just got their first department store, J.C. Penney's, in a movie theater. The local uh, movie theater group was going to run its first play that very night. Most of these buildings were destroyed. Right after the shaking stopped, citizens began coming together, crawling through the ruins downtown, searching for survivors, using ropes to heave people out of the debris. Uh, there was a team of Boy Scouts who were out uh, delivering phone books. They walked hospital patients down flights of stairs. Bystanders rushed to dig people out of the crumbling J.C. Pennies, and people used their cars to tow away huge sections of concrete facades that had fallen. Everyone jumped in. As another witness said, everyone was trying to do a little bit of everything for everyone. I want to play you, uh, just skip away from the screen for one second, uh, a clip of the um, ham radio operators at the time. Uh, the radio stations were destroyed and the rest of the world, continental US, didn't know what had happened. Um, so anybody who was driving a truck that had a ham radio at home uh, started transmitting messages of, of hope and of help. And uh, I included some of this in uh, one of the episodes of my podcast. So I'll just let you listen for just a moment to the first transmissions after the earthquake. Hopefully I pressed the right button when I said screen share. Uh, I don't know what the deal is here. Uh, uh, it is uh, how bad it is. The streets are all broken up. The bridges are broken up going out of town. And uh, it, it was a terrific one. Uh, all of the water mains and uh, sewer mains are all broken all over town. We're uh, uh, completely without water. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Oh, really? Easy, Nancy, easy. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Ham operators also. So um, hopefully, hopefully you heard that. It was um, uh, quite eerie to hear the first messages of um, of communication get through on ham radio. And funny enough, um, we're uh, pretty sure that that is still going to be our main form of communication when the, the big one hits here on the West Coast. The following day, um, so this happened in the evening, the following morning, hundreds and thousands of volunteers had spontaneously converged on the city's police station, uh, wanting to pitch in and help in any way. And no one in the city's government expected this. They didn't expect this onrush of help. Uh, they were worried about hordes of civilians chaotically uh, fleeing the hardest hit areas. They were worried about looting and violence, but none of that materialized. Here, everyone was actually piling on to help. Another witness said it was almost as if a dormant impulse was released for people to come together and care for one another that felt largely inaccessible in ordinary life. Right now, dealing with the invisible but relentless spread of a virus must seem very different to this instantaneous shock and physicality of an earthquake. And yet, if we are successful in our response to this pandemic, washing our hands, social distancing, staying at home, canceling plans, it all has to be rooted in this same feeling of interconnectedness that arose in Anchorage back in 1964. And I feel it. Uh, I feel this obligation to one another and our collective safety. We are coming together to keep our, difference, uh, our distance. But don't just take it from me. This is where we get back to some of the studies and the science. There, there was actually an entire field of disaster sociology that emerged after the great Alaska earthquake with studies and science that have been verified and used by sociologists who get parachuted into disasters all over the world after the great Alaska quake. And time and time again, they see this same resiliency, kindness, cooperation, qualities that they saw back in Anchorage 
they're seen all around the world. They turn out to be characteristics of disasters everywhere. So I just want to uh, read you from uh, the work of two sociologists who founded the Disaster Research Center after uh, the Alaska earthquake. Uh, let's see. This is from a 1975 paper, 11 years after their work in Alaska. In ordinary times, we suffer alone. Any acute experience of our own vulnerability can isolate us or even make us resentful of others. The victim often feels discriminated against since there are others who have been spared, but a disaster affects everyone and peels us away from mundane matters to the very issue of human life itself. When danger, loss and suffering become a public phenomenon, all those who share in the experience are brought together in a very powerful sense. An unrelenting immediacy sets in. Worries about the past and the future are unrealistic when judged against the realities of the moment and distinctions between people fell away, leaving only human beings responding to one another as human beings. And I saw this myself. I saw this, I have seen this uh, all around the world. Uh, I saw this in 2011 after the earthquake and tsunami in Japan. I traveled to Tokyo just three weeks after the disaster and it was eerie to be in Tokyo. Uh, the power was shut down in the famous Shibuya crossing. The trains were all quiet. People on the streets kept to themselves. It felt eerily like what we're going through right now. But then the cherry blossoms started coming out and people got together for the Hanami, the, the annual cherry blossom viewings. And people shared their stories of grief and hope. And I saw for the first time that resiliency and, and it's what kickstarted a new sort of wave of volunteerism in, in the country. And I did some uh, reporting uh, and I still, this was uh, one of the gentlemen I ran into at a cherry blossom viewing uh, festival. Um, Hiroshi and I are still pen pals to this day and uh, often talk about things that are happening around the world and we come back to the sense of resiliency. I've also seen it in Fort McMurray after the devastating wildfires in 2016 and in Florida after Hurricane Irma in 2017, people helping each other out, finding ways. Now, I'm just gonna take you out of the screen for one moment. Let's see if I can stop sharing, I'll come back to that. What we're seeing now as far as people coming together during this pandemic, it happened in Anchorage. It, it was the control case in Alaska and it has proven to be the case globally. It's staying home, but it's also supporting local businesses. It's checking on neighbors. It's coming together for virtual cosmic nights. It's volunteering. It's calling and lifting up friends. It's a 7 p.m. cheer. It's picking up food and medicine for your neighbors. And most importantly, it really is staying home. But here's where the leap for me gets exciting and hopeful. If we can go from Anchorage in terms of local to global for this pandemic, then it does give an immense amount of optimism for me. Getting through this will push us through to do the same things for climate change. And for many of us, the evidence is already mounting around us. I'm gonna take you back to that picture of the jellyfish. Um, you've probably all seen those, those first images of uh, the clear waters in Venice and, and indications of wildlife uh, returning after just a, a few weeks. Check this out though, as of a few weeks ago, Global CO2 rates are still rising, according to the data. In fact, unfortunately, we are on track to break a new global record this month, as we did last month and the month before. But scientists are keeping an eye out for a drop in fossil fuel emissions. And it might be the first time that an economic crisis has ever showed up in the climate change data. In fact, a 10% drop in fossil fuel emissions over a period of one year is not impossible in our current scenario. And I'm sure you've seen, again, more of these amazing issue, uh, uh, images all over the world as pollution levels drop fast. 2.6 billion people are living under restrictions right now. And that is having an impact, a positive one, not only on the virus, but also even if it is only temporary and comes at a huge social and human cost, we are seeing an impact on the world around us. I wanna show you um, some numbers. Most of this research comes from Financial Times and I'll share the link at the end of the talk. So already uh, this data mainly comes from uh, government agencies, um, but it's all uh, sourced. As airlines ground their fleets, cars travel, car travel grinds to a halt, industries shut down, we are seeing emissions plummet around the world. So already, uh, in February alone, uh, the, le the uh, coal that we weren't burning in China is already equivalent to an annual emissions of a small European country. Air quality in major cities around the world is cleaner 
than at any other time in recent history. In the US, emissions of CO2 are forecast to drop 7.5% this year. In the EU, daily emissions have fallen 58% compared to pre-crisis levels. And here on the BC South Coast, Environment Canada says that there has already been about a 40 to 50% drop in both uh, nitrous oxide and particulate matter. And those are the uh, ones that make up our health index. And finally, in March, uh, the airline CO2 emissions dropped 31%, about the equivalent of taking at least 6 million cars off the road for a year. I think I've got another picture to show you. Can I advance forward? There we go. Yes, here are some of the um, graphics from Financial Times. Um, and again, I'll link to this, but these were the ones that really uh, stood out to me. You can see here on the left, um, they're the same time period in for, for uh, cities around the world in 2019 and then March 1st to April 5th of 2020. You can see uh, Tehran in the top left, New Delhi, uh, Prague, Los Angeles, London, Madrid, Milan, Moscow. Those are all at nitrogen dioxide pollution levels. And you can see visually the dramatic drop. Uh, on the right, roads are emptier in major cities, um, obviously in the last seven days uh, versus historical average. And this was just published uh, a few days ago. So uh, these numbers are, are still pretty accurate. And finally, this picture uh, was sent to me from White Rock, looking at the Olympians mountains that you normally can't see here on the south coast. And I know we're seeing uh, those beautiful uh, flightless, planeless blue skies on our own um, every day, even though, side note, the high pressure has uh, diminished for now, but it will return only a couple days of rain. Didn't think I wasn't gonna try and sneak a weather forecast in there. Uh, the flip side, of course, is that we are also worried about uh, a delay in climate change progress. Uh, Glasgow Climate Change Conference that was set to be held in December is on hold and key events that need to take place in the next 24 months in terms of ratifying that Paris Agreement um, have all been put on hold. But climate scientists haven't stopped working. And right now we have this whole new branch of science that is holding the torch when it comes to the importance of science for community and people's understanding of science and how we can use it to solve issues. I mean, like you, my immediate worry absolutely is the pandemic that is taking place right now. But my hope is that science comes out stronger than ever, that people accept facts more than ever around the world. I think already politicians are recognizing it, the general public is recognizing it, and I don't have to tell all of you here on a, a science night, but I know we can work together to use this science to solve problems in the future. As the world is coming together to fight, to fight this pandemic, I, I hope that once we get through it, and we will get through it by using scientists and looking to the scientists for answers, I hope we come through it and we ask, we ask ourselves, now what can we get through together? We have just proven that we can beat this. And if the world can take this kind of sacrifice to fight a pandemic, what can a small incremental sacrifice over a longer period of time, what can that do to help fight climate change? I do think it's incredibly important to note that even uh, now more so than other disasters, a pandemic magnifies all existing inequalities. I read somewhere that while we are all in the same storm, we are not all necessarily in the same boat. We all come with very different uh, economic, financial health issues. So it may appear that to continue that analogy, some of our boats are less seaworthy than others. But there's no reason that the inequality we face going into this crisis uh, won't be more even coming out. Those inequalities have been made more apparent than ever. And just as cities have physically rebuilt after disasters using green energy like never before, uh, building more resilient structures and coastlines, more efficient infrastructure, and more reasons for ongoing local jobs and contracts after disasters, I hope that maybe we can do the same thing to even the playing field for all of us economically. I do have hope for our future Earth on Earth Day, that as humans, we will get through this. It will be hard, a lot harder for some people than others, but I hope we come through with a new shared understanding and empathy and a new way to re-examine the way in which we interact with this planet. I just wanna end by reading you an excerpt from the podcast, The Anthropocene Reviewed by John Green. I highly recommend it. Um, I will link to that also at the, uh, at the end, which is coming shortly. It is eerily revel uh, relevant though, even though he actually uh, wrote it a couple weeks before uh, the pandemic really took hold. We're the only 
known part of the universe that knows it's in a universe. We know we are circling a star that will one day engulf us. We are also the planet's best chance by far of exporting complex life to other places in the solar system or maybe even beyond. For any of that to happen, of course, our temporal range will need to extend beyond the next few thousand years. We'll have to find a way to survive ourselves, to survive in a world where we are powerful enough to warm the entire planet, but not powerful enough to stop warming it. We'll have to learn to better value life, not just human life, but biodiversity. Of course, our odds are poor. Humanity faces tremendous challenges. On the other hand, we have more collective brain power than we've ever had and more resources and more knowledge passed down by our ancestors. We are also shockingly, stupidly persistent. Early humans would track prey for hours and each time it would get up and run away and we'd follow it and it would get up and run away and we'd follow it and again and again until finally the quarry became too exhausted to continue and that's how for tens of thousands of years we've been eating creatures faster and stronger than us. We just keep going. So in a way getting through this will mean we have this collective experience and I hope it means we can get through anything including our uh, next biggest challenge of uh, climate change. So happy Earth Day from home, and I hope to see you all on the other side very soon. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Joanna. That was uh, amazing, a wonderful perspective. Um, we've got uh, already a ton of questions uh, coming in. Let's bring Rachel back in here as well. Um, there she Hello. is. Hey, Rachel. Um, Wow. Yeah, there was uh, lots, lots of great, uh, great stuff. Uh, hang on. Did you have anything? Uh, do you want to jump in there with Rachel? I did. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, Joanna, how do you personally stay optimistic when you're studying crises and disasters, especially after seeing these events firsthand? That that's a great question. And to be completely honest, it, it does get to me. I definitely have days, especially working in a newsroom where you see the human impact of the science of, of climate change and, and weather disasters and earthquakes all the time. But it's, it's exactly the coming together after these disasters that, that does give me hope. It's, again, the first images we see, it's the volunteers, it's the people on the ground, it's the sense of community, and, and it's humanity that really gives me hope uh, when having to talk and research and study this all the time. Awesome. So we've got about uh, eight minutes uh, before we wrap up here, but let's uh, go through some of these questions that are coming in from YouTube for you, Joanna. Uh, so first off, uh, what do you think society will need to do to continue the decrease in negative impact that we have as a result of the lockdowns? Uh, negative impact there. Oh, negative impact on uh, climate change momentum. Um, yeah. That's a good question. So I think... Uh, I think that's one that a lot of climate scientists are thinking right now. In a way, what's happening during this great pause, as some people are calling it, is, is the biggest experiment we've ever had. And scientists right now are using this as an opportunity to really understand where pollution is coming from and to really understand what a pause um, will do to CO2 emissions. And I think we're going to see a lot of data and uh, studies and science come out in the next few months. And I think that's going to help inform policy and inform our next step forwards. I would, I would never want to say that there is a silver lining to what's happening right now. But again, going back to the science, I think uh, coming out on the other side and, and having more of an indication of what incremental and smaller sacrifices can do. Um, I, I hope that that's what will keep happening after we come through this. Yeah. Wow. Um, here's one, and uh, for maybe both of you, actually, this is a really interesting question. Would the decrease in nitrogen levels in the atmosphere affect star visibility in the night sky? Uh, I can take a shot at this one. Um, <laughs> mostly with things like quarantine, um, what you're seeing is a lot less light pollution. So a lot less people are outside, um, a lot less... Uh, light, um, artificial light being polluting or polluting our nighttime sky. So we're able to see a lot more than we usually would um, in places like close to downtown Vancouver. Um, with nitrogen specifically, because it's not emitting anything in the visible wavelength, so what we would see with our eyes and what the colors of rainbows are made out of, um, it doesn't really affect your visibility um, in terms of looking at stars in the nighttime sky. Um, and uh... Another question for you, Joanna, how do you see the pollution levels changing after we get back to normal, whatever that, uh, whatever normal is? Yeah, also a very interesting question. Um, and I, uh, one that, that uh, I think I, I need to um, interview an economist for, because I think 
the um, pollution levels rebounding has a lot to do with how governments around the world decide to come back from this. Um, if it's a, you know, a step down approach, which it sounds like it will be for most countries, a slow return back to a new normal, um, that may even give us more indication of, of what kinds of changes we can make uh, on a, a normal day to day um, basis. But uh, if we do decide to sort of ramp up production and inject economies to get things going again, that could have a negative impact on pollution levels. And again, talks and, and policy um, have been stalled because of this. So um, hopefully, again, we see this as a chance to surge forward um, on climate change issues instead of stall. Right. Um, here's another question coming in. Do you have any words of advice for politicians as they prepare to restart the economy post COVID? Maybe that means there are some politicians uh, that are joining us for Cosmic Night that <laughs> snuck that in there. <laughs> yeah, I'd be very careful. I've, I'm completely scientific, factual based only. Uh, the, the one thing I will say about um, politics is that uh, we are seeing um, a breakdown of, of barriers that, you know, a, a pol political divides that used to be there are coming down. Um, you know, enemies are now our friends. And I think we're seeing more clearly on, on either side. I know that's not a universal um, answer. Um, of course, there are still two sides and, and partisan uh, issues happening around the world. But uh, again, I, I hope that um, politicians will again, turn to the scientists, because if we if we can take one thing from the way that the message has been communicated all around the world is that politicians are taking the advice and and the facts from scientists. They are the ones um, holding the daily briefings. They are the ones producing the modeling. They are the ones is, um, issuing and offering advice. And uh, if we can do that for issues like climate change, then uh, well, well, we can see how quickly we can respond to something like that. Awesome. Uh, and one final question that came in uh, talking about the uh, lovely space wardrobe uh, that we all <laughs> seem to be wearing and where we got it from, which, uh, of course, you know, I, I don't know about you two, but uh, I like to wear what I believe in. Uh, I believe in I believe in the universe. Uh, Rachel, I see you got your NASA shirt on. Yes. <laughs> uh, and Joanna, you got that amazing. But look what's going on there. Wow. There's a lot going on. I feel like we need Rachel to do a bit of a like flyby. Interpretation, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, Joanna, thank you so much for joining us uh, for Cosmic Night, our very first uh, virtual Cosmic Night. Um, you have been on Matt Leave. Uh, do you have any uh, Do you have, have any hints when we might be able to see you on, on TV again? I'm, I'm back uh, July 1st. So Ooh, whether okay. that's uh, working from home, uh, whether we set up a studio here, um, to be determined, but uh, I will see you all in some way, form or another on July 1st. Awesome. And uh, that podcast that you uh, that you mentioned that you put together, uh, what's that called? Oh, yes. I'm so sorry. I wanted to, uh, do you mind if I just share my screen really quickly? Yeah, and go for it. People can take a screenshot if you want. Thank you for reminding me. Um, here we here we go. Oh, wait, this is pretty funny. I know <laughs> I know that not all of the um, screenshots you've seen of wildlife returning are accurate. Most of them are. Dinosaurs obviously aren't. But um, yeah, here's a link to um, the two pieces that I, I pulled from. And if you want to listen to Fault Lines or 2050, the CBC podcast, you can find them on uh, cbc.ca. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joanna. Thank you for taking time uh, to, to uh, hang out with us. Uh, and, uh, and Rachel, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be doing more of this. Uh, this is our first uh, virtual event here at the Space Center, but this is kind of a kickoff because we're going to be doing weekly Q and A's uh, with uh, you, Rachel, uh, every Thursday at 2 p.m. And our very first one is going to be next Thursday. And uh, we're going to do things that we can see in the nighttime sky. And just to give you a heads up, uh, Joanna, I just the clouds have parted over here in Quetzalano. I don't know uh, what's going on over there in East Vancouver, but maybe we can see some stars. So I encourage everyone to go out tonight and uh, see what they can see and then jump on in next Thursday at two o'clock. We're gonna do a live session right here on YouTube. And then of course, as I mentioned before, we're gonna be doing an event on May the 4th, all about Star Wars, uh, everyone's favorite sci-fi movie, right? Um, and to everyone, uh, all of you at home, thank you so much for joining us for our very first virtual Cosmic Night. Uh, we are gonna be sending everyone a survey because we'd like to do more of these. So please let us know um, what more, what topics you'd like to hear from. Maybe we do something on black holes. Seems like uh, that's something that uh, Rachel could, uh, could nerd out about for a bit. Yes, think, definitely. <laughs> I could talk for hours. 
listeners. <laughs> awesome. Well, for uh, for me, my name is Michael from my kitchen. Thank you so much. See you next time. That's not a good heart. Hey, there's a better heart. <laughs> <laughs>